I want to say thank you to WPI. Uh, we appreciate the fact that they've let us use space here for a number of years, and, uh, and they were the inspiration for this event, and I'm going to introduce Todd Keeler. Uh, Todd put together, and they were looking for a way to commercialize potentially some of the research that they're doing, and they uh, appreciatively came to, to, w, or to the Venture Forum, and we're glad WPI did. So I want to say thank you to WPI for being a longtime sponsor, and I want to introduce Todd Keeler. Thank you. So I'm Todd Keeler. I'm the Director of Intellectual Property and Innovation at WPI, and my job is to try to find homes for any of the new technologies that emerge from our research. But first, I'd like to acknowledge Bogdan Vernescu, raise your hand, who is my boss, so I'm really buttering him up. Um, but it was his idea to do this because he would say, well, you know, how do people know what research we're doing? And, he, and then I thought of maybe the Venture Forum would be a way of doing that where people that normally wouldn't know what's going on in our labs um, could get a, a glimpse of that. Um, I would further like to embarrass Lindsay and Todd, uh, her, her colleague, and Terry Camisano, her, their mentor, who just got um, no that they are in a national uh, pitch competition in Washington, D.C. next month. Very prestigious uh, uh, program um, with uh, uh, lots of um, VCs, companies, uh, program directors of SBIR. Uh, so all that practice is paying off. And, uh, um, but in any event, we will have um, kind of a different format here in that um, we'd like you to give just a wetting of your appetite of what the technology is. So it's a three minute uh, pitch that they will give. They were allowed one slide. I cut a little slack to somebody who had to show her son on one slide and then the second slide. So forgive her for having two. Um, and I'm not worried at all. We have an undergrad, we have a grad and uh, nine faculty. I'm not worried about the undergrad or the grad being on time. It's all the faculty that like to go on and on. So I will be timing faculty with my little uh, watch here. And at the end, there'll be, if you're over, there'll be music just like the Oscars. Um, and we don't have any envelopes, so I can't make any mistakes. So, um, uh, so we'll, and, and Mark Rice is in the audience here. And I may ask him to assist me in keeping you on time, because he does this all the time at TAN meetings. So um, it's. Again, three minutes each, and at the end of that, each person has a, a station, and we encourage you, because it's, I should say, it's a, such a diverse uh, type of uh, technologies, from an educational, technolo ed educational technology, kind of gaming technology, to an antimicrobial uh, uh, coding technology, to um, actually, one of our faculty is actually giving an exam or, or teaching a class right now, and I put him last. If for some reason he's still there, you get me to be his presenter. But his is easy. It's, it's a, uh, an app you put on your phone that detects whether you're drunk or not. So that's purposely why we didn't have alcohol here tonight. So um, with that, um, we've got uh, the presenters know their order, and we'll um, start off with Lindsay. Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay, co-founder of Amp Protection, and we're looking to license our antimicrobial coating for urinary catheters to catheter manufacturers. Look to your left, now look to your right. One out of the three of you will have a medical implant at some point in your lifetime. This could be from something large and permanent, like a near hip, to, some, to something more temporary, like a catheter. In particular, urinary catheters are life-saving devices for hundreds and thousands of people each year. However, when they all too often become infected, they go from being $2 devices to $4,500 unreimbursed nightmares, leaving patients in excruciating pain and surgeons left to clean out crusty biofilms from the area, scraping out dead and infected tissue only to replace the implant once again. Adding to this, recent policy has defined these infections as never events or events that never should have occurred in the first place to be unreimbursable by Medicare and Medicaid. This has left heavy burdens on patients and hospitals alike. 
And even worse, all of these infections are treated with common antibiotics, which carry with them the threat of antimicrobial resistance and bacteria, considered to be catastrophic and projected to cost over $100 trillion and kill more people than cancer by 2050 if we don't act today. At M, at M Protection, we ask the question, why wait until tomorrow to fight today's infections? Thus, we have created a coating for urinary catheters based off of surface tethered antimicrobial peptides that will prevent 80% of these infections from occurring without promoting resistance, all to be licensed to, to our potential customers, catheter manufacturers. Antimicrobial peptides are the antibiotics of tomorrow. These are proteins found in a variety of species that have broad spectrum antimicrobial activity against many different types of bacteria, including the resistant ones. This is because of their unique mechanism. Additionally, tethering or tightly coupling them to the catheter surface allows us to deliver these peptides in the right, in the right time, in the right place, and in the right concentration, all pre preventing never invents. The $1 billion and growing urinary catheter market is comprised of three major players, or our potential customers, Bard, Teleflex, and Boston Scientific. Sorry. Um, we're looking to license to these potential customers. So with that, our patent pending technology will allow us not only to um, license to our potential customers and prevent infections and never events, but we can also save a lot of money, and we can stop resistance, but most importantly, save lives today. Thank you. I told you I wouldn't have a problem with the students. Uh, now, Richard, please come up. All right. My name is Richard Eberheim, and I'm presenting the cable-driven manipulator for additive manufacturing. Currently, additive manufacturing and 3D printing is a hot topic, and especially in the construction industry. Uh, it seems like every day there's some new startup that's trying to 3D print houses or other structures. But a lot of these technologies currently have major limitations. Uh, they fall essentially into two main categories. Either you have gantry style systems or you have systems that use some sort of robot arm. The gantry systems require that you build a large rigid frame over top of the building that you want to produce and then you can print it inside of that frame. Those frames are expensive to build, very large, they're rigid. You basically have to build a building to build your building, so it's not very efficient at all. The other systems that use robot arms aren't terribly effective because you're limited by the weight and length of that robot arm, and the higher the building goes, the less lateral reach you can have with your robot arm. So this technology that you can see pictured here intends to solve most of those problems by eliminating large bulky frames and replacing them with cables and allowing for a highly portable system that can be set up almost anywhere. The way the system works is you have in the center of that space there, which we would call our, our work volume or workspace, is the extruder. That's the part where the material comes out. And we can use all sorts of materials. Currently, most research is with concrete, but that could change depending as new materials become available. The four towers around the outside all have winches in them. And the cables run from the tops of those towers to the extruder in the middle. So by changing the length of those cables, we can then move that extruder around in our print area. And what's really exciting about this is the fact that we can put those towers almost anywhere. We can have uneven terrain. We can stick them literally just about anywhere. And by having different numbers and different heights of towers, we can then also build a building that's very long or very uh, tall or in any sort of configuration. And then just sort of that, that's this technology. I also work on another project um, called Aurora, which involves uh, Sorry, give me a second. Which involves a new type of radio sonde for balloon launch systems, um, for weather data gathering. Uh, the National Weather Service launches around 72,000 weather balloons a year, and they have these sensor packages on them. And these sensor packages, at this point, we get back less than 20% of them. And there's no reason why we can't reuse them. We just don't make an effort. So our system aims to fill basically a $15 million hole in the National Weather Service's budget by putting wings on those radio sounds and allowing them to fly back home to somewhere where they can be collected and reused over and over again. So thanks for your time, and that's all. And so several of the presenters have more than one patent, but we had them just present one. So like Richard has two totally diverse uh, ideas. Uh, you'll see a few other presenters have lots of technology, so um, if they're, don't be confused by that. Like this one has several technologies, but she's going to focus on one. 
Hi, I'm Marcia Raleigh. I'm a professor, uh, associate professor in the biomedical engineering department at WPI and very nervous to go after our students who are always so good at this. Um, so the technology I'm going to tell you about today is uh, focused on a culture surface that we can use to expand therapeutic cells. So many of the diseases, most, our most debilitating diseases, diabetes, heart attack, burns, are caused by a loss of cells that contribute to that organ's, therapy, that organ's function. So you lose those cells, you lose the organ's function. The good news is if we can put cells back that will restore that function, we can actually cure these diseases. The bad news is if you're talking about restoring a large volume of tissue, you're talking about hundreds of millions, even billions of cells. So how do we get that volume of cells? Well, the traditional way of, of, and we call this extreme cell culture, you see this person in a bunny suit who is, um, is, who is handling all these Petri dishes. So cells are in the Petri dishes and they're drinking this glorified Kool-Aid that we put on there that has salts and minerals and growth factors that are going to stimulate these cells to divide so we can get lots and lots of cells. But somebody has to go in and actually manually feed those cells every day. And these factors are really, uh, they're not very stable in liquid, so they're going to degrade within minutes to hours. So you have to continuously do it. So you imagine somebody coming in and, and changing all, out all the Kool-Aid every single day. That's very labor intensive and time intensive. These factors can be very expensive. So what if we had a way that we could get a controlled release of these factors into the culture medium that keeps them stable and reduces the number of times that you have to change out the culture media? So that's basically what our technology does. It's based on a, on a technology called polyelectrolyte multilayers, and it is what it sounds like. We have polymer electrolytes, so that have either a high positive or high negative charge. And by basically rinsing and repeating, we can apply these to a surface. We put a positive charge down first, then a negative charge, and you build up layer by layer this polymer coating. So the way this would work in practice, so what's so cool about it is it's easy to apply, like I said, rinse and repeat in an aqueous water-based solution. You can build these up as, as many layers as you want. That tunes the, the, the materials. Depending on what material you choose, you can also tune the properties. So it's very versatile. Um, and then finally, this is basically what it would look like. This little green dots down here at the bottom would be the, our bioactive factor, followed by layers of polymer. And then you add the cells. And, um, and so this would be released over time continuously into the media, giving a fresh, it stabilizes the growth factor and gives kind of a fresh, um, continuous release profile of the factor to the cells that are sitting on that surface. So who's our competition? Um, changing the media every day. If you have a cheap enough factor, that may be economical, but again, it's still very labor intensive. And then the other thing is there are many different types of natural polymer materials that will stick to a surface that, you, that will also stick to growth factors. But the challenge is that these, are, these natural fact, naturally derived factors have a high degree of variability. So we're looking to solve all these problems with our novel coding. Hi, right, yeah, I'm Ray Page from the Biomedical Engineering Department, and this is a project that we've been working on in the lab for about three or four years now with a series of MQP students. Um, and we, we'd like to call it a true 3D, three-dimensional bioartificial muscle model for therapeutic discovery and, uh, and drug and therapeutic product testing. And the real place this comes from, if you look at the literature across the spectrum of drug development and clinical trials, up to about 90% of the investigational drugs that have gone through all of the preclinical development and testing animal models, and even in some cases, initial uh, safety testing in human beings fail due to the lack of efficacy, which basically means they don't work. And after millions of dollars of investment, now you basically throw that out the window and go back to the drawing board. Why is that? Most of the preclinical models, the, and particularly the animal models, lack genetic homology to humans. We aren't mice, and mice aren't us. And for a lot of diseases, particularly the muscular dystrophies, there are gene sequences that are just not present in mice that are present in human beings, and so they, we couldn't give them the disease if we wanted to. And so, <clears throat> uh, the, in addition to that, there are a lot of drugs, and as some of the examples are statins, and there's also some arthritic drugs that have what we call off-target effects. And these are, the drug was developed for one tissue, but it actually has a toxicity that was unknown in a different tissue when you get into human beings. So, <clears throat> the problem is the current models don't reproduce the needed cell density or incorporate what the native extracellular matrix is in order to make a functioning tissue, like you can see here at the bottom, this little uh, bioengineered muscle tissue that's, that's uh, being flexed in the bottom there. And so what's critical about muscle, it needs exercise to survive. Anybody that's ever broken a bone realizes that you, if you basically you don't lose it, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so we need to be able to do that in three dimensions in a format that's amenable to really high throughput drug screening. Uh, to make these tissues. And so what our approach ent entails is incorporating cells entirely of human origin, different cell types, 
that are put into um, a, a, a construct that enables them to make the complex milieu that, that gives you the proper extracellular matrix that actually human tissues are going to have. We provide both active and passive stimulation in order to mature the tissue and make them actually look like and function like human skeletal muscle. And we can do this in a 96 well at the moment anyway, which is a high throughput, high content kind of format to determine the effects of, of drug toxicity or of drugs on muscle strength, toxicity, and potentially fatigue. And uh, <clears throat> we, this also, we can apply this to tissue from asymptomatic patients to look for side effects for off-target hits, as well as making micro tissues from individuals with a variety of different types of myopathies to hopefully be able to actually recapitulate that disease in a dish so that we can get a better uh, effective uh, product on the market. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Wow. I don't know what's gotten into these people, but there's time. There's time. Um, our young professor, uh, Dr. Hoffman, a, a, a new emerging professor with no intellectual property. I'm Alan Hoffman, a professor of mechanical engineering at WPI. I've been here an awful long time. Um, I, I'd like to talk to you uh, this evening very quickly about a two degree of freedom powered arm orthosis. Uh, this is an issued patent. The patent was actually issued in 2012. The three other names, Mike and Steve and Dan, uh, were undergraduates here when we originally did the work. And uh, Mike and Steve stayed on with me. And what you see here is a second generation uh, prototype of it. Basically, it's uh, two degrees of freedom, gives you elbow flexion and humeral rotation. And it's, it's wearable. That's one of its major features. Um, and uh, it was originally developed for muscular dystrophy. As an MQP, we had an association with uh, a, a state agency that uh, was residential for uh, young boys, teenage boys with young, uh, muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy uh, attacks you from proximal to distal. So in their teenage years, they have hand function but they can't lift their hand off the table. They have to do fing what's called finger walking. So that, that's its origins, and that, that really uh, explains somewhere how we got to where we are today. Uh, so we, we originally uh, did this work. It was remarkable to see these teenage boys who had never been able to reach for anything for five or six years in their life to be able to do it. So that was very rewarding. But if you look at the market for this, muscular dystrophy isn't very common. The, uh, the type we're working with, uh, 30 births per 100,000, and the, the market is distributed. So it didn't really have a market. It was a great, great invention, but it didn't have a market. So we moved on to look at something that has a market, stroke rehabilitation, 750,000 new cases in the U.S. each year. So there, there's a market. Along the way, we had two uh, organizations do uh, business plans for us. Uh, Stern School of Business at NYU did the original one, and then we got some students from Sloan School of Management um, to do a second business plan. As a result of this, we began to focus on stroke rehabilitation, that's from down here, but actually, since it's wearable, activities of daily living, things that, things that we all do in our daily activities. Uh, particularly, the MIT, the Sloan, business plan said, and they did an extensive, extensive job on their business plan, said you really need a hand function to make this a commercial product. And so we've gone through a number of designs for hand functions. I have a group just finishing up right this year on another design. But what we really need is a simple, I, I'm thinking now, passive hand function, flexion, extension, run by wrist rotation, run by wrist flexion and extension. And uh, it's pretty promising. So what I'm seeking is, uh, uh, since my students are long gone, uh, collaborations with people in robotics, because the, the way we're, we, our original circuits and that are kind of dated at this point, and marketing expertise. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction, he says. And oh, by the way, you were over three minutes, but I didn't have the heart to have the music go. <laughs> I stopped it with two seconds, so, um, <laughs> um, okay, Marco, yes, talking about robotics. 
So, so I'll talk today about um, artificial muscles, bones, and bind spiral control. For, so my lab is really interested in uh, how the biological system function, and we're also interested in uh, recreating artificial systems that have some functionality of biological system. And uh, possible use of these technologies is uh, for uh, rehabilitation, say stroke rehabilitation, also for prosthetics. So artificial limbs, legs, and arms, etc. And for obvious reasons, we are um, interested in novel technologies that also incorporate, uh, uh, so, for example, soft actuation. So more biologically inspired actuation, muscle-like muscle actuation. So several years ago, a group of my MQP students and I, we asked a question, could we maybe try to build a new artificial muscle, uh, maybe by using hydraulic uh, uh, actuation. And we came with a rather a simple idea, uh, and I'll talk about this technology later, I won't bother you now. And the project was quite successful. So soon after, actually Lockheed Martin approaches, and they got uh, uh, IP um, non-exclusive rights for, for this technology, and based on uh, Todd's office. This is the, the, the largest IP fee in WPI history. And what's good with this artificial muscle, which is now contender for the best artificial muscle in the world, is that it really functions like a human muscle. So same uh, construction, same, uh, <laughs> same forces, same speed. So, so we could really achieve uh, functionality that is really comparable to, to human uh, activity. <coughs> on, on, we have more time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So next step is high, uh, bones. So we want to recreate also the function of the bones and maybe also use these technologies um, to create n novel generation of braces and also prosthetics. And one idea that I, uh, that I was uh, struggling for a long time is could we create element that we could uh, modulate, uh, uh, fine-tune the stiffness. So basically, you, you could have something that is very soft, bendable, or you could have something very rich and very stiff. And I, I think we succeeded with that uh, problem. We solved that problem, and this is called the uh, hydro bone, and it utilized the, the uh, granular media jamming technology. And again, I will talk about this uh, later. So we build the braces. We also build the augmentation systems, so exoskeletons that could be used for load carrying. And uh, the most recent uh, technology is related to biologically inspired control. So now when you have all this material like in, in a biological system, so, so muscles, bones, tendons, and everything, maybe we could also try to play with the biological controls. And this is what we are trying to do. We are trying to mimic the recruitment of you know, human biological system and really obtain the, the same uh, uh, paradigm that exists in the human body. OK, so that's all. It's a great lab to go to. There's a lot of wild stuff in there. And that, Everybody's welcome to come anytime. And the, the fee, you know, I, it, I'd like to take credit for this, but he basically said, here's the license, don't blow it. And, uh, <laughs> and we were able to get it. Closed. Um, Yvonne, a totally different pivot from what you just saw. Hi, good evening. My name is Professor Yvonne Arroyo. I'm an assistant professor in learning sciences and technologies, and my pitch is very, very different. Uh, it's about learning and technology, and uh, many students find it pretty boring to learn math in the classroom, and teachers find it many times very hard to find activities that would make students really engaged with the material. And especially at the lower levels, it's very important for, for teachers and, and school systems to make this material interesting for students. What if learning math was really fun, like really fun? And it involved running around physical spaces, outdoors or indoors, and looking for mathematics in the environment and in objects in the environment supported by technology that students wear in the form of either cell phones or smartwatches 
they could wear them or they could carry them. But the, the cell phone or the mobile device would act as a support for students and give them help and tutoring in the way that an individual tutor or a teacher would, present with a student at all times. So in this particular game called Estimated, students were equipped with a 12-inch dowel that did not have any further markings. And students run around looking for specific objects that the watch told them to find. And they had to use that measurement tool to find objects that did not fit exactly the 12 inches, such as six inches tall or, uh, or longer. So this technology consists of apps. And uh, as you can see, the students were finding triangular prisms of a certain length. And what we know is, after testing with lots of students, is that students really learn with this first. And second, the teachers really like it. This game stimulates curiosity and puzzlement. They would recommend it to their colleagues. They would use it in their math classes with 100% strong agreement with those kinds of statements. And teachers and students want them in the app store. Uh, it's an app, right? But behind the scenes, this really is not just an app, but it connects to a central server called the wearable games engine that supports the deployment of the game, but also contains an authoring tool that allows people to create new games. We, can, we have created some games ourselves, but the idea was that teachers and students would create games themselves. And in that process of game creation, students can develop computational thinking, which is a very hot topic right now. Um, we have just finished experiments with students, high school students, uh, that showed uh, in Mass Academy, for instance, they create a huge amount of, of games and develop their computational thinking. That's it. Um, hi, my name is Susan Jamaspi, and I'm here to um, tell you about uh, the technique that my colleagues and I um, have discovered to identify dense fixation in a stream of gaze. And I'm going to explain to you why should anybody care. Um, Vision is our most dominant sense. We naturally scan our environment, look at things, and process visual information. 90% of information that we process is through our eyes. So if we can capture when a person is using a technology, using a computer screen, we can capture the information that they're processing, we can design systems that are used much more effectively. In particular, we are interested in cognitive effort. We know from research that if people ex, um, extend a lot of cognitive effort, they're not even going to use a technology. And even when they use the technology, if they have to expend a lot of cognitive effort, they end up not using the technology effectively. So cognitive effort is really important to us. So how do we, um, how do, we do this with eye tracking? We use eye tracking to capture where people are looking at a technology, for example, with a computer screen. And um, the, the eye tracker is unobtrusive. Is, that's an example of eye tracker that we're using in the lab. It's in the computer monitor. The user typically even don't notice it. Um, that particular eye tracker can uh, capture about 300 samples per second. The, the yellow dots are the gazes that the user is using to look at a screen. So if you want to identify um, cognitive effort, we have to translate this stream of gaze into fixations. Fixations are those yellow boxes. So when we filter this and we get fixation, um, fixation basically is when we keep our eyes, our gaze, steady to look at something more carefully. Um, so they're a very good um, uh, proxy for attention and, attention, uh, and focused uh, effort. So um, usually we look at these boxes, how they're distributed, and then figure out how the person was processing information. Um, something that nobody before us has looked at, people usually look at the boxes. But we start to looking at the little dots within single box. We notice our research showed that the way those little yellow dots are placed in a box carry information. When people are doing something that is hard, the fixations are very dense. Uh, when they're doing something that is more relaxed, the fixations tend to be more distributed or dispersed. So that gave us an idea. Why don't we look at, why don't we look at the densest fixation? Why don't we come up with an algorithm that we can identify densest 
of these little clusters. So we used an optimization method to identify densest cluster. This is a computationally hard problem, but we were able to come up with an algorithm that you could do it in a very practical way. So um, if you notice that our algorithm can at times even identify two fixation within one fixation, one typically considered fixation. As in addition to that, see, this is, this is a person looking at a web page. If you, in addition to um, cognitive effort, if you care about where people are looking at, the center of the box tells us the location, the center of the attention. The center in the yellow box and the center in the red box are very different. So our algorithm can give you the location of attention in a much more precise way. If we have that information, we, uh, we are actually using that information to design um, adaptive decision tools that can respond to a user's need. User is spending too much effort to give them feedback and the information that they need in a personalized way so that they can make much better decisions and use their computers more effectively. So another young investigator uh, who actually, we've, our most recent license was by Professor Brown in a totally different technology. So he's one that has multiple technologies he could talk to you about, but you get to hear about making our data great again. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't resist. And, and I'm not the Chris Brown that sings rap. That's a different Chris Brown. So I hope you're not disappointed. That was... Anyway, um, so this work comes out of our surface metrology lab. And uh, in surface metrology, we're trying to measure surfaces and then understand why they behave the way they do. Surfaces influence all kinds of things, the way things look, the way they feel, the wetting, adhesion, friction, um, fatigue, all kinds of things are there. But when we look at the literature, we find very few functional correlations that will tell us exactly how they work that could be used by designers to design a surface. So one of the reasons is the measurements. Now, we've gotten very good at measurement technology um, in the last 20 years or so. And we can very quickly have a million elevations, over a million elevations that are rendered in that image there. And you can see there's a number of uh, measured elevations that don't look right. There's a whole bunch sticking out of the bottom. And then we know we can't even measure a whole that deep. So we have to do something with these outliers. And, and what they tend to do is they confuse the data. They skew stuff. If we're looking at peak to valley depth on a surface like that, trying to correlate it with, say, the friction on that surface or adhesion on that surface, those, um, those uh, doubtful observations are going to mess us up. So we could use some sort of thresholding and just say, all right, so we could cut those off, and, and, and that might work well on that one. But th sometimes they're a lot more difficult to get. So, um, so we want to avoid detection of these signals. Now, it's not just in measuring surfaces. It could be measuring all kinds of things like eye motion. Um, and, uh, and you could also use it to detect unusual behavior in, in, in some sort of situation. But our application is, is surfaces, and so we could use it also to find anomalies. And, and so in this, um, so you can see there's a little outlier right in the top of the sphere. And when we use curvature to try to detect it as opposed to just height, you can see it becomes a great big, from that little blip on the top, a great big indication. So it's much easier to pick out. And, uh, and, and so here's another example on a profile. Um, and so we look at it also with respect to scale, because you may have clusters of outliers. Uh, that, uh, that you need to treat as well. And so here's, here's another example on that. Thank you. Thank you. Benjasu, we jump from one technology and pivot to another. And uh, this one is one of many that you have that uh, if you talk to her, have her explain some of the other apps that she's working on. Hi, everybody. I'm Beng Sutulu from Foise Business School. And uh, I'm going to be presenting you one of the many apps, as Todd mentioned, uh, that I'm working on with my colleagues at UMass Medical and here at uh, WPI. This one is about weight management. And uh, we've been about seven years ago, and we sit down with uh, Sherry Pagota, who's a clinical psychologist who specializes on weight management and has done a lot of weight management counseling in person uh, in clinical settings. Uh, we realize that the apps that are out there in the marketplace are mainly focused on one strategy that uh, clinical psychologists use during their counseling se sessions. That's tracking. That's one of the most effective strategies, but it's not the only one. 
And if you've ever tried to lo you lose weight or try to track your diet, you know how difficult it is, how easy it is to quit that process. So what happens to those of us who are trying to go on the right path but lose direction and stop tracking? There's nothing to catch those folks uh, who fall off the wagon. So we decided to implement some of these other t t strategies, which are uh, more than a dozen, um, to bring it in an app format and bring it to you as a virtual coach. So Habit is focused on one of those strategies, which is called Behavioral uh, Ideographic Problem Solving Strategy. And it allows you to first uh, determine what kind of a challenge are you facing that's stopping you from going in the right direction. Once you determine what challenge it is through our problem, uh, questioning process, which we call brainstorming, then we uh, present you a set of solutions. And these solutions are based on the research that we have done that we collected from a uh, large set of uh, users, or people who are trying to lose weight, uh, effective things that, uh, that are evidence-based that we know it would work if you can make one of them uh, fit into your lifestyle. And then we allow you to build habits around that solution. And we come back and check with you a week later and see how that's going. And if it's not going well, we know that one, one size fits all does not work. We move on to a different strategy for you to try. And as you go through and in, kind of uh, invest in these different strategies, you figure out which one would be the solution that would work for you and stick with you, hopefully. So this is an app that uh, has gone through a number of pilot studies that have produced very successful results. And we think that it will be paired with one of these tracking apps as a you know, supporting strategy once you stop using the app. We could come up with this new feature for you to use and uh, bring you back to the right path that you're trying to go. So I built up all that timing stuff and everybody was on time, so that's great. Um, so it's my fault. I asked Emmanuel uh, Agu to come and he had his class and he said, well, give me a time frame. And I said, 7 o'clock, because I actually thought we were going to start these pitches at 6.30. But we had a backup plan. So you, I'm his backup plan. And my way of doing this, if I can get this to work, is he was on like every news station just before um, New Year's, because it's uh, Alcogate is his product. And it's about detecting whether you are drunk or not. Each of us has a unique way of walking. No two people have the exact same gait. We naturally sway back and forth, but alcohol affects your natural stride. How drunk you are is proportional to how much you sway. So the more drunk you are, the more you sway. Professor Emmanuel Agu of Worcester Polytech Institute studies how people sway more as they drink. We captured the data from the sensors, and from this we can basically do some analysis. All those sensors are already built into the average smartphone. Agu feeds them into an app his team created, Alcogate. You have GPS, you have the two cameras, you have microphone, you have so there's all these things in the phone that we can use to pull data from the real world and make intelligent um, applications. To test the app, they use these special goggles, which distort your vision and make you sway, as if you were legally drunk without having to use any alcohol. You've given a sample of your sober walk to the app. And that's the baseline for how much you sway ordinarily when you're sober. Team members Andrew McAfee of Lunenburg and Ben Bianchi of Melrose can walk down the hallway with the Alcogate app, and based on how they sway, it estimates their blood alcohol level. It distorts your vision, so when they walk, they actually sway just like they, were, they would sway if they were drunk. And they're hoping it can help other college students. 40% of college students binge drink. And in many cases, they binge drink, and then there's all these other uh, consequences, you know, unsafe decisions. After clinical trials involving real alcohol, the team hopes to build features that could prevent you from starting your car based on your stride or make you get a designated driver. When you're too drunk to drive, an Uber will call for you automatically or a cab. The app wow. is not publicly available yet, but after the more testing, WPI team hopes to release it in the next several months. Well, I have to just sort of be a contrarian here. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm tired. I work late. Yep. I don't even drink. 
I can sway at midnight <laughs> when I'm walking out of here. It knows how to read that. They've, they've built that into the program so you would know how to do it. And it, what it does is have you walk and kind of get used to the way that you walk and then notices that you're starting to sway a little bit more, a little bit more, mm -hmm. and the more you sway, the more you've been drinking. And that's how they check your wow. blood alcohol content. Inter it is very interesting. Oh, it is, really it is. And it's all in your phone right now. They're not like Well, and then it ties money. into your car's app and prevents your car from starting. Exactly. Look out, exactly. you better it will walk also, straighter. It will, that's fine, <laughs> I, right? It will also geotrack where you drink more at. So maybe you shouldn't go to that friend's house tonight or See, tomorrow night. It's just night a lot of here. information. It's really good, yeah, but it's kind of neat. Big it's brother, but yeah. Emmanuel will probably walk in and he's like this rock star now. He was on every single station around there. So um, uh, again, uh, we're hoping to get a grant with Brown, our IRB. We don't have a controlled place where we can get people drunk. Uh, Brown does, and we're hoping to. But it's a clinical trial. Don't do this. It's not at some fraternity house or anything like that. And so that they can control it, because you're really going to have to test this versus the breathalyzer uh, or some other gold standard. He really has it standardized, I'm getting over my time, of uh, the, the regular uh, test that the police will do on the roadside. At, at least this would make that much more objective. So with that, um, those are all of our presentations. I want to thank Joe and <laughs> Phil Sear, I don't think is here, but the two of them really coached us and helped uh, Bogdan and I uh, set this up and hopefully you got a good taste of what's going on. It's very exciting time here at WPI with technology just bursting at the scene, but we need entrepreneurs. We need help in getting it out the door because we know how to create things, but we need that commercial application to make it really work. So with that, thank you.